Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Julie. Um, well, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, to hear John speak about Native American mounds. We've got lots of interesting information for you. My name is Emily Krawczewski. I am the site manager here at the Heritage Center. Uh, Brett Peterson is the guy who is helping out with the chairs. Uh, he's our executive director here as well. And um, Julianne O'Connell is our site manager at the Warden's House. She's in this fun sweater up front, so be sure to say hi to her. <laughs> Um, our next program, just so you can put a few things on your calendar coming up, um, on Tuesday, March 21st, we have our treasurer, Tom Simonette. He is going to be talking about the most infamous uh, madam in his, here in Stillwater. <laughs> Should be a very interesting evening. That's again uh, March 21st at 7 o'clock. After that, we have our annual membership meeting. That's going to be next door at the Stillwater Events Center. Uh, so RSVP to that if you haven't already. And of course, tonight we have a big treat for you in the form of John. <laughs> so um, I'll be quiet now and let him get started. Um, of course, if you have questions about the museum or anything, or of course about the warden's house, feel free to see one of us after. Thanks for being here. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I got a text. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that going to get me? I'll hold it. <laughs> Do the Bob Barker. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, my name is John. Um, thanks. This is a big crowd. This is a lot of people here. Um, everybody is curious about the burial mounds. Um, how many people here have experienced seeing, you know, happening upon burial mounds? Wow, that's crazy. So, I mean, part of me is, you know, I'm. I'm not an expert. I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I've been living in St. Croix Valley for about two years. I'm a historical writer. I've made historical documentaries in the past. They've played at places like the State Historical Society. There's a couple of my films that are archived there. And I've been volunteering as a tour guide here at the Warden's House, which has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Julian. And um, it's something that just the, you know, kind of got into the more I realized how much there was here, right? And I think maybe all of us are that way, that we have been maybe having this idea of um, like, a, like a, a long history here that, that is um, maybe just indefinite, like you're, you're indist indistinct, but you know that there's um, a lot of, you know, presence in the St. Croix Valley especially, but in a lot of different places. And um, it's kind of a, a cool thing that I have learned as I've been studying burial mounds and prehistoric archeology span in our region and across the United States that there is this, maybe almost an unspoken stewardship where people are aware of burial mounds that are on a property. Uh, there's no requirement to take care of them. You know, especially in the old days, you could, you know, a lot of, we lost obviously a lot of these sites to agriculture and other development, but there has been a great amount of, you know, really inspiring stories about how people of their own volition have just kind of cared for these sites and fostered them into the current generation. And um, so I, I can see that there's just a lot of people here who probably have had similar experiences where they have seeing these sites, they, they understand the significance of them, even if they might not fully know the details behind them. And so I just went a little bit further because I'm a, just that kind of a, you know, curious guy that I went and tried to find out more. So this is a little bit of my journey about where I'm at right now. Uh, I am not at the end of this journey of uncovering information about these sites or what they mean. Um, and neither is the archaeological community. And, and you know, there's a lot of openness about you know, facts and um, what we know. And the, you know, that's part of the kind of the humility you have to have when you're talking about the subject is that there aren't a lot of definitive answers. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the information about these kinds of important world history sites, just we don't have written records. We don't have the people around today to tell us about a lot of why they built these. Um, but we do have 
a lot of information just from the sites themselves, and we have enough to at least point us in some general directions about you know what what um, what these were and and why they are as important as we all feel that they are. So let's begin. Um, Native American mounds of the St. Croix Valley, a writer's work in progress. So we're going to kind of go through a little bit about how I've come to be in here in front of you all today. Um, this is me. That's a pretty cool spot, right? Down to the St. Croix. Works <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a camper. I, have a, I got a pop-up camper. I'm not a cabin guy. We do a lot of hiking. I've got two young sons, my wife, Jill. Jill, she's probably on watching through the phone right now. And uh, we like to get out into the St. Croix River Valley. Uh, we've lived in Minneapolis for a long time. We moved out to the St. Croix Valley because we spent most of our time out in the St. Croix Valley. We camp and hike and we spent 15 years out here. So we figured, let's move here. So for the last two years we've been here, we've been enjoying the hell out of it. And <laughs> this is where you'll find us usually on the weekend is out in these sites that we all share together, which is kind of, Thing that motivated me to learn about this story more is you know, there's this feeling of shared history here that we all kind of um, steward forward, right? This is where I grew up. I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota. I lived on the Missouri River, and this was my site. This was my experience when I was a kid playing in the sandbars, river culture river life, boating, camping. Um, and it's not anything I thought much of until I was older and we moved here. Oh, this is this is a Mandan village site right along the Missouri River. That's my son, Julian, right there, doing a dance. And, um, and then we ended up here in another river valley and quickly noticed that there's similar kinds of practices here. Same kind of, everybody's got the same kind of childhood memories about growing up in these places. The things that you used to do when you were kids and, and when you're older, you used to look back on them and you realize, uh, you know, there's a, like a special kind of nostalgia you have for the things you did along the river. And I started to think back to this valley and I realized that probably, that feeling is um, very old and ancient, maybe. You know, the, the, the landscape that is here is a landscape that's existed for thousands of years of human civilization in these areas. And that, that feeling of, you know, we probably all know what it's like to sit around on a sandbar, you know, on a Saturday afternoon when all the work is done and sit in the still water and, you know, warm up in the still water, still water of the river current, you know, from the river current. These are things that just are universal. And uh, it's so fascinating to think about how long some population has been experiencing that together back through history. And so I started to want to create a writing project that was going to get that across, that was going to kind of layer the history and, and show it all kind of together rather than as different stages of people arriving, right? And try to show this kind of shared experience that just continues to live through the landscape. We're all shaped by those uh, landscapes that we're in. Um, this incidentally, this is, that's Fort Abraham Lincoln right there. That's, um, that's the last residence of George Armstrong Custer before he went off to work for his uh, little date with history. And right next to it is the Mandan village. This is the Mandan tribe. And they speak a Sioux-based, Siouan-based language. So they're kind of related with the Dakota tribes out in the Dakotas. We don't have a ton of Mandan presence left. It was that they are still, but I think they are part of the three affiliated tribes in North Dakota. I need to learn more about that. All right, so why are we here? All right, so as I kind of had these insights, 
and I um, wanted to learn about the St. Croix River Valley in general, the, the wider history of the St. Croix River Valley. You read a lot of um, local histories written by our amazing population of storytellers and historians that are represented here and elsewhere. And you will inevitably re read the first chapters of many of these local histories and you will learn about the, the tribal and prehistoric history that took place in the valley. Um, one specific book went a little further and I kind of regret it that I read this one <laughs> because, because it has brought me to all this. Mom's going up but um, it's this I'm upstairs. Kind of a popular history book, The Peril of St. Croix River. You can go buy it now, it's in it's a lot of different shops. Um, there's a lot of it in it that maybe you can be you can't verify is true, and that is tricky, but I think it's instructive that one of the first lines in the book is, is literally the real intention is to bring life to a forgotten historical era that inspires one's curiosity to search for more. Thanks, Ken. Um, there, it, it has a particularly lengthy section on prehistoric earthwork construction and uh, makes some amazing claims that I have been unable to substantiate with the state archaeology office or a lot of other um, historical sources. So I don't want to confirm any of them as true, but they definitely um, made me think deeper about the, the level of intelligent design in the landscape that I wasn't thinking about previously, just by thinking about the kinds of earthworks that were existing all around me that to my eyes before that looked like natural features. Um, and then it's a, definitely an eye-opening moment when you realize there's a lot more intelligent design in the landscapes than you assume. Burial mounds are one aspect of that. But you know, the, some of these, um, especially the later prehistoric cultures managed the earth in a fairly sweeping way and folded it in a way that might still exist to our eyes today that we just, we just can't really see anymore because we don't know what to look for. So that kind of set me on this journey to find out more. Um, step two of this journey, you don't know what you don't know. This is the, the blissful time. So I started to just go out and look for some of these sites that were mentioned in this book. And I found amazing places that are just in the St. Croix Valley, but I think the, the key one that really inspired my awe was this site in Berkmos Park, which is over on the bluff overlooking the St. Croix Valley uh, from the Hudson side. And it's um, an amazing array of burial mounds that are overlooking the you know, the lake of St. Croix right there. It's, it's just a really kind of awe-inspiring spot. And if you haven't been up there, I would encourage you to go up there and just spend a little time there. It's a great place to be. Um, but immediately, I, I could get the sense that this was a, a place of great history, ancient history. Um, but who built these things? What, what's the, what are the facts behind them? I, I, you know, that's what I really wanted to get at. I didn't want to just live in that sense of wonder. I wanted to know specifics and facts as much as I could. So then I started getting into the reading. You can see these are some of the great sources that I've consulted along this way. The big one is this Indian Mounds of Wisconsin book. So the Indian Mounds of Wisconsin, this was a book that was published in 2000 by the University of Wisconsin Press. And um, did, Wisconsin particularly is a center of uh, prehistoric earthwork construction in the whole country. Uh, it is a, an important nexus of this kind of um, architecture, you want to call it. And so they have dealt with particular interest over the years. And so finally in the year 2000, they published this book as a kind of a catch all frequently asked questions about earthworks, burial mounds, as much as they could possibly disclose because 
clearly there's an issue with maintaining confidentiality. These are burial sites. Um, there's been issues in the past with digging into these sites and, and you know, disturbing them. So they are, try to be as discreet as possible, but also try to be as um, transparent as they can be about you know, <coughs> as much as they know about these uh, these traditions that produce these uh, burial mounds. So some key facts here that you can get out of this book. There are 15,000 to 20,000 earthworks um, at the peak of the culture that produced these. Um, 4,000 of which remain today. Um, literally the first publication that the Smithsonian Institute produced was on the subject of these mounds by increased lap from who's one of the pioneering uh, American archeologists working out of Wisconsin at the time. Um, this quote is from that, from the book Indian Mounds. This landmark book talking about Lapham's book uh, was the first attempt to systematically document the visible remnants of ancient civilizations in the state, particularly the sites of earthworms. This book is a good classification of the four main kinds of earthworks. Conical mounds obviously are the one that we know the most here. Uh, they're the earliest mound forms that were made. You can see kind of a cutaway here of the typical way that they were constructed. Uh, they almost always contain human burials. And the first types appear as early as 5,000 years ago, mostly in the Southeast USA. So we're talking like Louisiana, Arkansas. And, um, you know, spreading in prevalence across the entire North American continent from there. The effigy mound is the second type. Uh, these are earthworks that are constructed in animal or human shapes or symbols. They can be large. You'll see here some here that are in linear forms. Um, they were built hundreds of years after the conical mounds. Um, in the vicinity of the Conical Mounds, however. So there's the sense of a shared tradition, even if they are separate cultures, maybe that produced them. There is this kind of, even back then, a sense of stewardship of the original burial mounds that carried over into the cultures that would eventually take control of the area and you know, carry forward the traditions, right? So there's this, there's even evidence of continued burials that would happen in the conical mounds from, you know, happen from, um, from people that were around, you know, centuries after the original construction of the mounds that they kind of sh would share those burial sites together. Um, it's believed to be, these are believed to be monumental expressions of an ancient belief system. And, uh, that's kind of key to some of the questions about the mounds that we'll get to in a little bit here. Uh, most contain human burials, some do not. So even in these large animal shaped or symbolic shaped um, effigy mounds, you still see human burials in all of these. Um, and then there you have the enclosure style. Those are less prevalent around here. Those definitely focus in the southern part of Wisconsin, mostly um, narrow ridges forming circles, squares, and rectangles, um, but they are built in among with the effigy mound groups, and there is likely a system that we don't fully understand for why they're there. And then we have the temple mounds. Those are more to the south. <coughs> um, they serve as platforms for ceremonial structures. They're kind of like truncated earth and earth pyramids. They are associated with the Mississippian culture, which is if you've ever heard about the Cahokia or the kind of the large earth work cities and you know they're around kind of the St. Louis area. Um, they were probably the most urban dominant Native American society before European contact. And they farmed out of kind of that middle Mississippi area, but forayed up here. There's a there's actually a large earthwork complex of pyramid style temple mounds in Southern Wisconsin. And there's even evidence of them up as close as around Red Wing and up the Mississippi River. So 
so they their reach was far and inevitably they probably got up into our neighborhood as well we just don't have um evidence of you know huge temple mounds here who built the mounds so there's this great mound builder myth that dominated the debate about native american mounds through the 19th century until archaeology ethnology modern scientific methods were able to establish that the mound builders were the ancestors of the native americans but that wasn't accepted or established at all as fact for a long time um and so myths would arise about who constructed all of these major architectural wonders and so you know it was something where through the 19th century, as you're having European um, settlement coming west, they're encountering a lot of these earthworks. You know, there are these major uh, construction wonders, but they don't seem to have the manpower or the technology out here available to have produced them. So there's this sense of a disconnect of who truly produced these. And so the theories abounded from lost tribes of Israel who had been out here in the West, um, the Vikings, Aztecs. I mean, that you, you pick your explanation. There's an explanation for who created these mounds and earthworks. Um, but we have been able to establish that it was in fact the, the ancestors of the modern tribes that exist today that produced these. Um, but that interest led to a widespread, I mean, it was a sensation um, about the interest in, in the origins of these mounds as we came west, as the European settlers came west and encountered all of these um, to the point where the first documented excavation of a burial mound to find out more scientific objective facts about them was performed by a young Thomas Jefferson. And he's still considered by you know the archaeological community to be kind of a pioneer in American archaeology because of that. In Minnesota, we had Theodore H. Lewis, a skilled land surveyor. In the later 1800s, he was the main surveyor of the burial mounds and other earthworks that are existing in not just Minnesota but you know 18 states is where he worked. He mapped 13,000 mounds in 18 <laughs> states in one province. Um, 900 of these are effigy mounds in Wisconsin. He covered 54,000 miles, 10,000 on foot to get this all done. And to this day, his, his um, skill in land surveying is pretty legendary among the archaeological community. And we're lucky that we had somebody like him working in teamwork with other equally impressive people to get this project done while they were still around because we have lost a great deal of these sites now but his notes and his surveys are kind of a, a key resource to this day that any archaeologist now will look back on to base their research on this is a handwritten hand-drawn survey that Lewis did of a rattlesnake effigy mound that was down in Afton. It does no longer exist. Um, but we know it was there because. Where was that at? Well, so that the specifics about that aren't given. Um, I do know that there was a, a wastewater project uh, 10 years ago in Afton that had to be diverted because it was going through some of the original sites there. But even the news article wasn't specific about where. Yeah, it was Washington County. It was on the Washington County. So, but it's um, it it's amazing to even you know, refugee mounds aren't very common in the Saint Croix Valley at all. Definitely, the conical mounds are what you see here. Um, so this is uh, very timely that. Lewis was able to get this recorded before it was lost. So just some maps here um, just to show just to show you kind of Wisconsin's place with the effigy mounds. So Wisconsin is you'll see down here, especially these southern 
counties here, Madison especially, is full of epic um, effigy mounds of many different kinds. The University of, of uh, Wisconsin's grounds are full of preserved effigy mounds. Uh, their lake systems have many effigy mound complexes there. It's a center, it's a real center of effigy mound culture. And you'll see that there are specific kinds of varieties that are dominant. You will see more water-based effigy mounds on the Lake Michigan side. You will see more bird-based based effigy mounds on the kind of the Mississippi Bluffs associated with sky spirits versus water spirits. And you'll see kind of a language evolving out of the symbolism in these effigy mounds developing. And so luckily, Wisconsin, because of this huge concentration and this nationwide interest in burial mounds, Wisconsin passed special state legislation that protected a lot of their archeological sites, even on private land, whereas federal regulation only usually protects archeological sites if they're on federal land. So Wisconsin to this day has better preservation than many places to be able to appreciate these sites, which is why you know we're lucky to be on the Wisconsin line here in the St. Croix Valley, that Berkmos Park is part of that tradition of preservation there. Here are a couple of images of effigy mounds. You'll see the snake patterns. You'll see the bird patterns here. Human shapes as well are sometimes employed. Human shapes have a real geographic focus. They tend to be in the south part of Wisconsin along the Wisconsin River, I want to say, towards the confluence of the Mississippi River. There are more human shaped effigy mounds there than anywhere else. And that's not entirely clear why there are a lot of um, other earthwork installations there that make it seem like it was a ceremonial place of some sort, or some kind of a neighborhood of maybe a, a, a district that, that there's been some theories about that maybe that was a training ground for the shaman class. And so that's why there's a little bit more of a symbolism of human characters there because these represent shaman class. <clears throat> but that is not definitive at all. Some burial practices in these mounds. So obviously in these mounds, you're going to see traditional burials. But an interesting facet of the burial practices is the secondary burial, where a lot of times you will see evidence of uh, an initial burial, or maybe not even a burial, a lot of um, of the prehistoric tribes would allow the bodies to fully decompose above ground. And then at that point, they would either um, disinter the previously buried body, or they would take the, you know, the body that had been you know, put in a, in a different place. And they would fully clean off the skeleton, and they would assemble it into a bundle, a, specific, a little bundle. And then they would bury these bundles in the ground and then assemble the burial mound over them. Um, and along with these burials, you would find a lot of rare personal belongings. And the, the quality of these suggests that these were elite members of the tribes um, with actually larger mass graves that are nearby, but not under the burial mounds. So the burial mounds definitely denote the status of the people who are buried in them. And the personal belongings also show just the range of trade that was happening at this time. Even thousands of years ago, you'll find Atlantic seashells in a lot of these. You'll find obsidian, which is something that is almost exclusively obtained in the Yellowstone region. You'll find obsidian items, uh, copper items. Um, copper was actually um, something produced in Wisconsin. And so you, you'll find a lot of these rare items there that show, um, you know, definitely the social kind of strata that maybe existed. And it'll also just tell a little bit about, you know, the values and the things that the, the people at that time cared about. Um, another aspect that is interesting about the burial practices is that 
when these secondary burials would happen, it was almost a seasonal event in a lot of these uh, communities. So communities in general would go and take their, their burials and they would assemble the burials together. And it was a time of like a community kind of a togetherness. Um, it was even used in some senses as a form of alliance with other communities nearby where they where certain communities would work together and have a burial ceremony together. They would bury their communities members together and it would be a form of alliance that way. <clears throat> This is something also that came out of the need to uh, excavate the burial sites and learn more about who these mound builders were and learn about you know, their practices was that we had until even just you know modern times, it was a common popular practice on a Sunday afternoon to get the family together and go and open up the burial mound. So there's those spoken photographs like this of people who would go out and try to find arrowheads or whatever, you know, whatever they want to, whatever you want to find. And so you see a lot of destruction of sites at this time. And so at that point, that was um, where our archaeologists started to realize we definitely, you know, there's a need to excavate these sites to learn about who built them to um, make sure that even the, you know, the, the, the tribes who exist today could fully understand their history and, and you know, confirm their oral histories about you know, that their ancestors were the ones who built them. So it, there was a, a purpose to digging into these sites, but it started to obviously go too far. About what time period is that? The, I mean, they, they're really the change in thinking about excavation versus not is something that came about in the 1960s and it came about because of a specific advance in archaeology so it's actually right here so it, it started to be um, a, a realization in the archaeological community that the mound sites told us about what the prehistoric cultures believed what they valued but that that it, to really understand who built the mounds it's actually far more valuable to look at habitation sites uh, you can see just through the patterns of the, how they made their pottery and their tools, you could classify different cultural groups by that and see, okay, this is a certain group of people here that built these. This is a certain group of people here that built these. And they were able to finally start building these groupings of tool using culture. They, you wouldn't really call them nations because you wouldn't, you're, you know, never, you know, the whole world uses iPhones, right? So it's, you know, the tool you use doesn't necessarily say your nation, but you can at least say this is a group of tool users, tool users that, you know, share this tool use in common. So it's at least a way of starting to organize who the people were that, that built these. But the real advance was radiocarbon dating in the 50s and 60s. That really allowed us to not only separate groupings of, you know, how certain pottery was made by certain groups of people, but then you could radiocarbon date this pottery and realize what was the older culture, what was the newer culture. And so it became far more valuable to see these, you know, test these um, fish hooks and, and pottery and other, you know, distinctive pieces that you could find in the, in the, the living sites rather than digging into the mound sites. Um, so in the St. Croix Valley, we have a couple of notable habitation sites that have the cool archaeological studies that have been published about them. The Sheffield site, just south of Arena on St. Croix, is a is a neat one, just on the on the river. Um, it was probably more of a hunting camp, um, not necessarily a permanent settlement, um, but there is plenty of there to suggest you know, thousands of years of inhabitation there by different cultures. And it's just by going through the strata and the ground of the different tools and the different makes and radiocarbon dating them. Um, interestingly, next door to the Sheffield site is a set of burial mounds that no longer exist. But the, the, the burial mounds were clearly much older 
than the habitation sites. So you could see this kind of coexistence, even you know, in the archaeological record of you know, ancient structures next to you know much more recent um, civil or settlements. Um, and you can determine that by seeing in the burial site that there is a certain vintage of pottery that's only in the burial site, but literally 50 yards away is a community that has thousands of years more recent pieces that are there. And there's a clear delineation between the two. And then there's also the Harvey Rock Shelter, just north of Stillwater. This one, uh, for a long time, was known to have even rock art on the walls. That's all since decomposed off of there. But again, that's another uh, interesting study to read and publicly available. But you can start to see a little bit about the people who were here. And you start to learn a little bit about um, yeah, this kind of shared location that, we, that we've all inhabited. And so a lot of the mounds they have, you know, as, as you've seen, were built probably by just ancestors of, they, they, the belief is largely Dakota um, ancestors. Um, but the Sheffield site and the Harvey Rock Shelter show much more modern tribes that lived here after burial mounds ceased to be used and, and they, they were using more individual burials. And it's just from the tools and the, the pottery that they use that we're able to tell that there are these different levels in this long history of um, habitation here in the valley. This is definitely just a bunch of names and dates. So, but the basic idea is, um, you know, the earliest prehistoric cultures are 10,000 years old in, on the continent. Um, and we don't know a lot, obviously, about the oldest cultures here because it's the hardest evidence to find. Um, but you do see definitely that trade increases. How do we know trade increases? The burial sites have evidence of, you know, distant places that are in the burials. Um, you start to see evidence that the burial places are becoming more associated with territory and cultural markers. They're starting to be something that's expressing something about the people. Um, it's not just you know, a barrier, can, you know, a utility thing. It's a part of cultural expression. And then about 500 BC is when you move into the woodland stage. And that's really where you see the, you know, the vintage of burial mound that we see a lot and that you know, we associate with burial mounds. So thinking about that, that's Roman history, right? 500 BC, right? That's when we're talking about these burial mounds were constructed here. So if you think about the Colosseum or the Parthenon in Athens, then when you look at the burial mounds here, you're looking at the similar vintage of artifact that's here. That architecture is here among us. And so um, you'll see here that we see much more rare trade goods here. Status is becoming more stratified. You're seeing a lot more kind of unique classes, especially kind of the, the priest classes kind of rise to be an elite status. And then you see, this is where you get the evidence that the mass graves have been found as well, but they are accompanying the burial mounds as kind of a lower class. All right, so this is a, when we really start approaching the modern day. Late woodland, corn agriculture appears, permanent settlements appear, bow and arrows replace spears. And this is when you see, consequently, the rise of the effigy builders. You see this kind of peak of economic power and organization that occurs here. And the at similar time as the late woodland area, you also have the middle Mississippian and the upper. Mississippian, which are called the, on, the Oneota, uh, developing south of here. And uh, like I said before, in kind of like the region around St. Louis, and they're building the real, the most epic earthworks and pyramids. This is the, 
kind of a conceptual picture of the area down there. And their influence was widespread and eventually moved up the Oneota, especially. We're up in our area. The Sheffield site shows you know, plain Oneota presence. So that you know, we had the Oneota in our vicinity as well. And that did bring about the end of the mound building because they did move to individual graves. And, um, and then we see a large population decline after that. And it, it's obviously at the point of European contact that we start seeing huge population declines in their, in their societies and abandonment of these huge urban centers. And some conceptual images of maybe what the Mississippians looked like in their dress. So why are burials near bodies of water? This, I think, is just such a cool aspect of what we can learn from what we have. So their items in these burials teach us about their cosmology, kind of how they see the universe. And it's not just their items in the burials, it's um, the way that they, one after the other, consistently decorated their pottery that shows this kind of symbolic concept of upper world and underworld. And you'll see just the, um, a consistent symbolic language that's used across all of these things that they create and the effigy mounds that they build in Wisconsin also contain the same symbolic connections, right? And so what you see is this kind of upper and lower concept where you have sky creatures and spirits, birds, you know, and, and similar kinds of shapes that are associated with the sky. And you see those in high bluff areas. Um, Obviously, the Mississippi River has got high bluffs. It's also a major bird superhighway. And so I think that was obviously existing at that time as well. Another thing that we share with those past cultures is that we see those bird migrations the same as they did. And so you see a lot of sky um, symbol, symbolism um, associated with that. The underworld. We gather from the archaeological evidence is a watery subterranean place, water creatures, lizards, and bears. Bears is an interesting one. The Menominee, their underworld kind of leading divinity is the white bear, which is an interesting when you think about white bear lake. And that leads you into this concept of why these burials are almost exclusively always situated along major riverways, major lakes, is because in their cosmology, the water was physically the entrance to the underworld. It was a way for their past on to access the underworld. So it wasn't just prime real estate. It was the, it was the way that their deceased were able to access the underworld. Stage four has been verifying this. NPS reports, the National Park Service has produced some excellent reports that are available to read about the St. Croix Valley since they've taken over, since from the 70s onward. Um, LIDAR starting in the last 10 years, we have been able to do LIDAR surveying of the topography that has confirmed a lot of the remaining mound sites that exist, and they are fascinating, and it's a way to confirm a lot of what our surveyors saw 100, 150 years ago. And then DNA studies have been revolutionary in the last 10 years to confirm again a lot of the you know the, the DNA evidence we have in the burials and to show the obvious connections with the existing tribes that are alive today to show that this one's definitely their ancestral tradition despite theories to the contrary that have predominated in the past. 
Um, all kinds of great firsthand archaeological reports are available in the Stillwater Library. The Stillwater Room there is an awesome place to go. Central Library uh, in Minneapolis has got a couple of exclusive sources there that you can read there on site but can't take with you. And then state archaeologist offices and preservation offices are obviously a place that I've, I've been trying to go to as well to confirm as much as I can. They have um, an obligation to be secretive and be and, and to not disclose site information and burials because of obviously the past of digging into these sites. So it is trickier there to build a rapport, but um, I am lucky I do have some archaeologists that are friends in different places and so they have been at least instructive to me about general principles and ideas and ways to think about going about my writing and my research, but they are a great resource as well. All right, so I just wanna grab a couple of things here to just kind of show the scale of what we have here in Washington County. So this was part of the survey that had been done with LIDAR, cataloging existing sites. And um, because of funding, they could only isolate to the 16 most populous counties in Minnesota out of I mean, 83 counties. And Washington County is one of the 16 for the most populous in terms of mound sites and mound and burial uh, complexes in the state. So we are down there, 309 recorded mounds, 22 total mound sites. And you'll see kind of the distribution of where they are clearly in the parks and in the wooded areas are where they have been able to survive the most. This one is an instructive graph. You will see the amount that LIDAR detected and the amount that was reported. LIDAR detected a lot more out here, but in a lot of these places where previous surveys had reported a lot, LIDAR has shown obviously major decline since those times. Oh, this is oh. this is just the general distribution of mound sites. This is that six top 16 counties. You see a pattern with the distribution? Water, right? Mississippi River, the lakes around Hennepin County are Trying to think about the lakes of Hennepin County, not the, the lakes themselves are geolocators for a lot of oral traditions and stories from before there was history to keep track of things. You can use the bodies of water, which have been here forever, to corroborate a lot of different oral tradition stories because these lakes have been around lately. The lakes have been here forever. The stories that have occurred around these waterways, um, you know live among these waterways still. Yeah, so um, it, it's, it's, I don't know if it has to do with the amount of that have been found, right? Because it's a, it's a real dense wooded area to be able to get to, but International Falls has the most spectacular existing mound site um, that still exists in Minnesota. The great, the Grand Mount is a, in International Falls. So, and the, so the, there definitely is a mound tradition up there. Um, I do know that, I mean, a lot of the, just the, the travel and, and migration patterns came from around Lake Superior on both shores and obviously across Wisconsin from Lake Michigan. So, and you know, encountering the Mississippi River. So I think that is why there's such a focus in that area, the river especially. The highways of the, the rivers of the United States are um, kind of underappreciated for how amazingly naturally convenient they are. The, 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 the river system of the United States is unlike anywhere else in the world for being absolutely navigable with almost no technical improvements needed at all. 
uh, it's a huge advantage that this country enjoys to this every day. You can literally get in a boat in the Gulf of Mexico and end up in Montana without any logistical issues at all. And that is just doesn't, that does not exist in almost any other country, even a major river system like the Danube in Europe. Um, there's all kinds of dredging and, and infrastructure work that's needed to make that a fully navigable river. The, the, the highways that the rivers um, enable in the United States is, um, it's all worth its own study, just on the, the impact of, in, in our history. So I'm assuming that the, because of that, you know, you see the, the, the river traffic and what the Mississippi River has represented for thousands of years to all the people who have lived here. And that's probably why that's the main neighborhood of the population, even going back that far. These are just cool. These are the, the LIDAR scans overlaid with some of the original surveyors. And you can see a lot of them match up. These are a little off. You see there's a mound, there's the mound. So these are there. That is maybe that one. But you can see how accurate some you know, the, the surveyors were. And you can also see here's a here's the you can also see just how many there are in the landscape. If you see these standing on the ground, they probably just look like a hill, a natural feature. And then when you start to realize the extent of the intelligent design in, in the landscape, it's kind of mind-boggling. It's very eye-opening to, to feel the, the presence of the civilization that's no longer here, but still has a presence. What is that? Um, you know, they give the they give the site number, but they even in these published reports they don't give out specifics because they want to be protected. There's a neighborhood. There's a cemetery that has a burial mound in there. Coexistence of the same concept in the same place. Are these people aware? Most of the time, yes. Most of the time, they are aware, especially once the, the, the study probably was published. But yeah, you know, I, I see so many stories of families that have known they have mounds on their property. They're under no obligation to care for them, and yet they do, and they they foster these places. Look at how many there are in just that, you know, a couple of plots there. All right, stage three, get outside. So that I, I opened with those photos that I took over at Berkmost Park in Hudson. So if you want to go to a place tomorrow, that is just a great start where you can see some of these burial mounds that still exist. And it's a public place that's well known. You're not going into anybody's private property. Um, this is the site on the St. Croix River Valley to start. It's just up in Hudson. You can search for Moose Park. Um, there are five burial mounds there. They are overlooking St. Croix Lake. And I mean, it is awesome up there, really. Um, they are estimated to this. So the state archaeologists did get back to me and let me know that they estimate those are middle or late woodland period. So those are a thousand years old minimum. You know, 1200 AD is when the Black Plague was going through Europe. That's how long ago those were built. And they're believed to be built by the ancestors of Dakota tribes. And these are original photographs, obviously, before there was anything else overlooking. Uh, you know, there was, there's no marina down here. Credit to Wisconsin. I mean, the Packers were a problem, but I mean, they did. <laughs> They did some good stuff in the realm of archaeology. <laughs> Green Bay resident right here. <laughs> name and change, name and change. 
All right, stage four, and this is where I'm still going forward on this. So reaching out, right? Lead a talk at your local historical society. See if you meet any new knowledge sources. <laughs> and tribal outreach, which I am beginning, and I'm getting advice on doing that with um, some of my ranger friends who are experienced in tribal outreach in their jurisdictions. And, you know, it's a question of, you know, even the um, the book that burial mounds the, the the Indian mounds of Wisconsin that book has a lengthy forward at the at uh, to start it off saying we um, didn't specifically reach out to a lot of tribal sources for this book because the general feeling is is um, so much has been taken already why would we tell you anymore and they respect that and then they conclude by saying. We hope at least that by publishing this book, we'll inspire tribal writers and resources to publish knowledge that they feel is appropriate for the public to know. So, but I, um, and, and uh, the advice I've had from my friends that have, that have kind of guided me on this next stage is to think about it in terms of what would the outreach mean for them? How would it benefit them? And not just for our curiosity, what you know, what is going to be the benefit on their end for engaging in that partnership? And so that's something I think about about how that can work. But that's where I want to go next, and it's just one part of what I want to create about this valley. But I, obviously, it's a part that is so essential, and it is not going to be just the first ten paragraphs of a general settler history of the valley. It's, uh, I want to do something that creates the sense of a continued presence to this day that is just um, exists among all the other history that's taken place. Thank you. Why were they those particular Counties studied when there's mounds all over Minnesota. Funding. Funding. Okay. They 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 were able to establish a certain scope that their grant was going to be able to cover. They had originally proposed 24 counties to study. Um, and then when the grant funding came through, they realized that it just through experience they were going to be able to really make that money stretch for 16 counties. So they picked the 16 most populous burial site counties in Minnesota. Um, I read uh, the Ken Martin's Ken on St. Clair Valley. It's an excellent book. And people up the store, if you ever want them to come to your, your home and help them search, if you think might be in the mound there, it's willing to come. Also, the um, I was sad to learn that he passed away because I wanted to go pick his brain as well. Yeah, too bad. It's young. We just had a, we have a mound in our woods in Lake Elmo, and uh, we just had it uh, authenticated just a month or so ago. We knew it was there, but now the state came out. There's several sources that can come out. If you, if you think you have a mound on your on your property, but it's good to, to know that and to, to protect that. It can ride on your meat, your garbage does, and, and then it can't be destroyed or farmed over, or you know, it can be protected. So, um, the, the State Historical Society, um, the State Bureau of Indian Affairs, who else came? It was like four or five of them. Office of Preservation. What's that? Office of Preservation, maybe. Maybe, yeah, Amanda. <laughs> anyway, they'll come out, they'll help you also authenticate the mound. But it's good to have them protected and found and protected. Put it on your deed also. Question did, did they have it surveyed or was it unsurveyed before you brought it to their attention? It was unsurveyed. Okay. We were told about it. When we bought the when we bought our farm, and um, 
So we sort of always knew it was there, and then we had you know, several people come on and say, hey, did you know? Uh, and um, and then we, we, we finally, we're, we're putting our land in trust, so we had the, the state come out and not it. So I don't know for sure, but they think it's ours as ceremonial. They don't think it's burial, but we also live, we live for a while up in, in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so we know from up there that anytime you have a, a water source in the woods and an open field, you, you're probably going to have a mound in there somewhere, at least mm -hmm. one. Because we, we know one for sure that that's also what took out this hook up. Plus, the geologists that live next door. <laughs> <laughs> Find yourself a geologist if our neighbor. That's always good. <laughs> That's awesome information. Thank you. Yeah. I guess this kind of goes off of that question, um, just because I know we'll probably get calls. Um, if someone thinks that they may have a mound or would like to know if they do, who is the first person they call? The Office of the State Archaeologist. Okay. They will, they will, they feel no, you know, daily inquiries and they are the ones that are responsible for construction permits and, you know, they're, they're, that's the place you would want to start. Um, Jean Day also says on uh, chat, she's been told that there is still a mound or mounds north of Centerville Lake in Centerville and Oka County. Do you have any knowledge on that? I don't know about that one. Mm. Centerville. Okay. Think about this mountains view, right? Mm -hmm. There's no mounds there anymore, but at the, the, store, the, you know, the spoken histories were that originally it's it's called mounds view because up on the top of this the, the the high elevation there there were mounds that were so pronounced you could see them from any direction and that's why the, the town is called mounds view nice. okay. well, thank you so much Absolutely. thank you for thank you. Yeah.